students endeavor to clash with thought. I pray, oh God, that you would help them to be articulate, help them to be conscious, O oh God, that the discussions are also for the benefit of this beautiful island. And as they go about, Lord, let the persons or the group who have done the best research and make the best presentation come up on top. But of course, oh God, we know that this is not just not for who wins, but of course, what we could learn from the research that they have undergone. So may we have a wonderful sitting here and we beseech your presence here as we do this, participate in this wonderful program that will benefit the students and the nation on a whole. We ask this prayer in Jesus' name. Thank you, Pastor Louis. If we can all stand, please stand. We will now have our territorial song sung by Mistred Mildred Chamber, Chalmers. Apologies, Mistred Mildred Chalmers. Mr. Chalmers. Again, welcome everyone. I would like to take a brief moment to underscore the importance of statistics. Our intention is to raise awareness as well as continue to build and foster meaningful relationships with our key stakeholders while molding the young minds. We want to see st statistics become a pillar for household discussions. Moot, lack of evidence-based decision-making continues to stymie the economic development of the Caribbean region. It is a very relevant and topical. So please pay close attention to the debaters and keep in mind we will at some point open the floor for further discussions and input. Our moderator for this evening's debate is Ms. Thandy Williams. And I will now hand over to Ms. Handy Williams. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. And welcome once again to this afternoon's debate. Thank you, Alfie, for such a warm welcome and also for introducing the purpose of statistics so far. 
this afternoon we have a very interesting debate in front of us. The moot, and I quote, the lack of evidence-based decision-making continues to stymie the economic development of the Caribbean region, end of quote. But before we get into it, I would like to first introduce our debaters for this afternoon's proceeding. The proposition which are seated on my right hand is led our first speaker is Ms. Shanae Taylor Lee. Let's give her a round of applause. And her second speaker is Ms. Ashanti Francis. On my left, we have the opposition, who is led by Ms. Rhonda Allen, the first speaker. And the second speaker, Ms. Beyonce Osborne. This evening, we have some capable judges, so please permit me to introduce our judges for this afternoon. Our head judge is Miss Angela Greenaway, and she is a lecturer. Mrs. Greenaway is a graduate of the University of the West Indies, Mona Campus, and the University of Bradford in the United Kingdom. Her work experience has encompassed public utilities and transport in Jamaica and over 30 years in the public service of the government of Montserrat. In Montserrat, Mrs. Greenaway has served in the field of development and strategic planning in posts as economist, senior economist, director of development, permanent secretary of development, and cabinet secretary. In these posts, Mrs. Greenaway actively contributed to the formulation of strategies for growth and development of the national economy, the development and monitoring of policy across government, external affairs and trade, information technology, and the platform for the collection, management, and dissemination of government information, broadcasting, and the managing of cabinet affairs. She has supervised the statistics department for many years and is therefore very familiar with the role of statistical information in development planning. Mistress Greenaway is currently a lecturer at the UWE Open Campus and the Monstrat Community College and also consults on many disciplines. Ladies and gentlemen, Mistress Angela Greenaway, our head judge. <laughs> Mr. Martin Parlett. Beyond his professional work, Martin is a published academic in the fields of rhetoric, political communication, and race studies, and is the author of Demonizing a President, the Foreignization of Barack Obama. In 2008, Martin worked as a campaign manager for Barack Obama's presidential campaign in Virginia, developing communication initiatives rolled out at the national level. A founding member of his school's debating society, he went on to debate at Oxford University, where he also was the recipient of the Oxford Leadership Prize. Currently, Martin is the head of the Program manage Management Office for the government of Montserrat, responsible for overseeing project, program, and portfolio management. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Martin Parlett. Ms. Gracelyn Castle. Ms. Gracelyn Castle earned a Bachelor of Arts degree in Library Studies from the University of the West Indies in 1982, a Master's of Arts degree in Archives from the University of London in 1987, and a Master's of Science degree in Computer Assisted Management Information Systems in 2003. She worked in the Munstrat Public Library from 1982 to 1997 and in the main library at the University of the West Indies, Mona, Jamaica, from 1997 to 2005. In August 2005, she returned to Montserrat to take up the post of resident tutor and head of the UWE School of Continuing Studies, now called the UWE Open Campus Site, Montserrat. Her role as head of the community of the site, sorry, includes managing the delivery of online and continuing professional education programs, community outreach, public service, research, 
and publishing are also some of her responsibilities. She is currently enrolled in the Distance Learning PhD program in Cultural Heritage at the University of Birmingham. While working at the UWI Mona, she has also served as an adjudicator for the university's debating society. Ladies and gentlemen, Ms. Grayson Castle. <laughs> Mr. D.K. Rostant. D.K. has spent 19 years in the field of media and communication. This has included aspects of presentation, production, and coordination. He has a Bachelor's of Arts in Media and Communications, while with a minor in Cultural Studies and a Master's in Communication Studies. His interests lie in the realm of culture, education, wellness, and community outreach. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. D.K. Rostant. Mr. Kenya Lee. Mr. Lee is currently the Director of Economic Management within the Ministry of Finance and Economic Management. He holds a Bachelor's of Science in Economics and a Master's in Finance with a focus on economic policy. Mr. Lee is a staunch advocate for the need for independently verified statistical evidence-based policy, advice, and decision-making. Mr. Lee was a member of the Monstrat Debating Society during his high school and college years and thoroughly enjoyed the experience and will always be willing to lend his support to allow the new generation of students to, end, to experience the same. Ladies and gentlemen, there you have our judges for this evening, Mr. Lee. We will also be judging a best speaker at the end of the evening and tasked with this, we have the head best speaker judge, Ms. Angela Eswick. One year ago, Ms. Angela Eswick, whose academic achievements culminated in a master's in management of technology with distinction, joined the regional organization, the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank, and cur currently serves as the country manager for Montserrat. That professional advancement followed Ms. Eswick's public sector experience, during which, after teaching, she served extensively over more than a 20-year period in several roles, spanning various disciplines. Ms. Eswick completed a 16-year stint as a statistician in both the economic and social sectors, stemming from her desire to be a user of data. Having mastered the production side of the field of statistics, Ms. Eswick stepped further along her career path and became the Director of Policy and Development Planning. During that tenure, her role evolved and expanded as she served as Acting Cabinet Secretary and then Acting Permanent Secretary with the Office of the Premier. During this time, she also provided technical support to the statistics department in the absence of a director while serving on various boards and committees across the public service. As a graduate of UWE, Cave Hill, the City, of, the City University and Nottingham University in the UK, the disciplines of economic development, social research, strategic planning and policy, and of course statistics and information technology are just some areas of her expertise. She is popular for her exceptional command of the English language and her command of both French and Spanish. She has not limited the benefits of her range of expertise to the office. Very relevant to her role today is the fact that Ms. Eswick has served as a debate judge on several occasions, to include serving as the head debate judge in the 2014 Leeward Islands debating competition that was held here in Montserrat, Ms. Angela Eswick. Our next best speaker judge is Mistress Kimona Daniel Bourne. Mistress Bourne is a past student of the Montserrat Community College, graduating as valedictorian in 2006. She's a 2010 graduate of the University of Technology, Jamaica, UTEC, where she attained a bachelor's in medical technology with first class honors. She's a postgraduate post of uh, 
with the masters in biomedical science with management studies with distinction and a past shivening scholar she is currently employed at the Glendon Hospital Laboratory as a senior medical technologist. Ladies and gentlemen, Mrs. Kimona Daniel Bourne. Our auditors. Mrs. Patrina MacArthur was born in the Nature Isle, Dominica, and has adopted the Emerald Isle, Montserrat, as her home for over 34 years. She is the mother of three lovely children, aged 21, 16, and 15, respectively. Mistress MacArthur holds a Bachelor of Science degree with first-class honors with a major in economics and a major in statistics from the University of the West Indies, Mona Campus, Jamaica. She has just completed her master's degree in economics and econome econometrics at the University of Kent. England and is presently awaiting her results. Patrina has passion for reading and interior decorating and enjoys spending her time with her three children. She also has a passion for outdoor planting of flowers and is an avid nature lover. She is currently employed at the statistics department as a senior clerical officer with added responsibility as a statistician and is heavily concentrated in the economic unit within the department. Mistress Patrina MacArthur. <clears throat> Miss Simone Fenton. Ms. Simone Fenton is presently employed as a statistician within the statistics department and has over 15 years experience working with the government of Montserrat. Ms. Fenton holds a Bachelor's of Science degree with honors majoring in statistics and a double minor in economics and demogra demography. Ladies and gentlemen, Ms. Simone Fenton. Miss Jasmine Jean Baptiste. Miss Baptiste was born in the Nature Isle, Dominica, and has adopted the Emerald Isle, Montserrat, as her home, having moved here over 16 years ago. She is the mother to a wonderful 12 year old boy who enjoys being referred to as her heartbeat. Ms. Baptiste holds a Bachelor's of Science degree in statistics and a minor in demography from the University of the West Indies, Mona, Jamaica. Jasmine has an avid passion for astronomy and enjoys beach days, hiking. She's sorry, and hiking. She is fluent in French and Spanish and enjoys reading articles on current affairs. She is currently employed as a statistician at the Statistics Department, Montserrat. Ladies and gentlemen, Ms. Jasmine Jean-Baptiste, our auditor. Our timekeeper for this afternoon will be Mr. Maldrick Weeks. Maldrick completed his O-levels at the Montserrat Secondary School in 2017 and recently completed his A-levels at the Montserrat Community College this year in 2019. For the near future, he is aspiring to be an architect. Ladies and gentlemen, there you have our officials for this evening. Let's give all of them a round of applause. The mood for this afternoon, and let me just repeat it once again. The lack of evidence-based decision-making continues to stymie the economic development of the Caribbean region. And as I've already introduced our debaters for this afternoon, it is now time for me to give you the rules for the rules and guidelines for this afternoon. The leader of the opposition shall make his or her case for a maximum of 10 minutes. The leader of the opposition shall then make his or her case for a maximum of 10 minutes. The second speaker of the proposition shall make his or her case for a maximum of seven minutes and the second speaker of the opposition shall then make his or her case for a maximum of seven minutes. 
the opposition shall have a maximum of five minutes for rebuttal, and then the proposition shall have a maximum of five minutes for rebuttal. At the end of each speaker's allotted time, the speaker will vacate the lectern. The timekeeper shall give a warning signal one minute before the expiration of the speaker's allotted time. And I'm going to ask Mr. Weeks to show the signal that he will be giving. Have you seen it? And then again at the end of the allotted time. Following the rebuttals, the adjudicators will be escorted to a secure venue for their deliberations, and deliberations shall last no more than 15 minutes. Before the start of the, the deliberations, the auditors will collect the score sheets on which the scores achieved by each team will be recorded by the three judges. The auditor will then compute the final scores, determine the winning team, and turn over the results to the special adjudicator. The auditor is allowed 15 minutes. We will then, in that time, have an open discussion while they are deliberating, and this would last about 15 minutes. The discussion will be around the mood and anything that you would like to present on the debaters. Upon your return, we will then have the chief best speaker adjudicator who will also give brief remarks on their best speaker for this evening. So the criteria for the debate, this is what the judges will be looking for. They'll be looking for soundness of point and you'll be awarded 35 maximum points for that. So we're looking for outline your structure, if you have a sound argument, and if you have adequately explored the topic. We're looking for logical development, and you'll be receiving a maximum of 20 marks for that. Were you clear and engaging? And have you defined the moot and the key terms? Presentation, that is dealing with audibility and clarity, you'll receive 15 marks maximum for that are you fluent is your diction and articulation good what about your vo your voice modulation and your control your posture and personality when you come to stand here are you charismatic in your delivery what about your body language so make sure that you're thinking about all of that you'll be given 15 points for that your command of language 15 points, grammar usage and appropriate vocabulary are some of the um, things there. We will also be looking for your coordination and your general analysis of the debate, your recall of point, and this is dealing with the rebuttal, sorry I should have said that, um, your recall of points, your ability to refute the points, 20 points, your spontaneity, six points, and the grand total, you'll be, you're, you'll be awarded out of uh, 50 points, okay? So without further ado, debaters, are you ready? Great, so without further ado, I would like to call the proposition, the first speaker, Ms. Shanet Taylor-Lee, who will be speaking on the topic, the lack of evidence-based decision-making continues to stymie the economic development of the Caribbean region, and she will be proposing the mood. Ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome Ms. Shanae Taylor-Lee. Florence Nightingale said, I collected my figures with a purpose in mind, with the idea that they will be used to argue for change. Of what use are statistics if we do not know what to make of them? What we wanted at the time was not so much an accumulation of facts, but to teach the men who are to govern this country the use of statistical facts. End quote. Madam Moderator, 
Honorable judges, my worthy opponents, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Like Florence Nightingale, my colleague and I are here to teach the men and women who are to govern this country the use of statistical facts. We will do so by supporting this evening's moot. The lack of evidence-based decision-making continues to stymie the economic development of our Caribbean region. So that everybody understands why it is important to, base evidence, to have evidence-based decision-making, I will show you, one, the alternative to evidence-based decision-making and their effect on the economic development. Two, what it really means to base decision-making on evidence. My colleague will then continue to show you how failure to use evidence on which to base decision-making has and continued to stymie the economic development of our Caribbean region. But first, Madam Moderator, we will, in the customary but tradition, but required tradition, define key terms. Lack is defined by the Oxford Learner's Dictionary as the state of not having something or have enough of something. The clearest definition of the term evidence-based decision-making is given by veto violence as a process for making decisions about a program, practice, or policy that is grounded in the best available research evidence and informed by experiential evidence from the field and relevant contextual evidence. The Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines stymie as to present an obstacle or stand in the way of something. The Oxford Dictionary defines economic development as the process in which an economy grows or changes and becomes more advanced, especially when both economic and social conditions are improved. The financial glossary of marketbusinessnews.com says that economic development also refers to the process by which the overall health, well-being, and academic level of the general population improves. Madam Moderator, the bottom line of economic development is improved living standards, and improved living standards is reflected in higher level of education and literacy, higher workers' income, better health, ability to feed self, and lifespan. Madam Moderator, I will now restate the mood as follows. Making decisions based on no or not enough objective, data-based, or scientifically-based evidence about programs, practices, policies, presents an obstacle to improved living standards in the Caribbean region. Madam Moderator, now that we understand the terms, we must consider any argument in favor of evidence-based decision-making acknowledges that other criteria can be and are often used as a basis for making decisions. Some of these other criteria include the following. One, corruption. Here, decisions are made in order to maximize the private gain of people making the decisions of those with whom they are associated with. The chief of United Nations Drug and Crimes, Yuri Fedok, said, corruption is the thief of economic and social development, stealing the opportunities of ordinary people to progress and prosper, end quote. Madam Moderator, a look at Trinidad and Tobago's ranking in the World Bank Corruption Perception Index shows they have steadily fallen from the 83rd percentile in 1996 to the 47th percentile in 2006, 
and to the 41st in 2018. There are no real estimates of the exact cost, but if Trinidad and Tobago roughly follows international patterns, the cost to its economy is likely to run into the billions of dollars each year, leading to the steadily decline in the economic development seen in Trinidad and Tobago. The same is true for Haiti, Guyana, and other Caribbean islands. Two, political ideology. Madam Moderator, a common sense of political ideology is where an incoming administration terminates the programs most closely associated with the previous government for no other reason bec than because they are associated with them. Where have we seen that? And who has felt the effects of the decline in the economy? Three, habits and traditions. Madam Moderator, we all know the saying so well, oh, how are we do things wrong, yeah? way of making decisions. We especially see that in the government where perfectly good resources are left to get old and rot and then dumped. Resources that could be used for the economic development of its people. Possible economic advancement dumped and trashed because of how are we do things wrong yeah. Madam Moderator, so what does an evidence-based approach to decision-making require? It requires that those in charge, tr charge of making decisions, try. Try their absolute best to put aside their own opinions, likes, dislikes, personal tastes, habits of thinking, values, beliefs, and emotions, and look instead at the evidence to help make their decision. President and CEO of Prevent Child Abuse America says, when somebody asks what we should do to address a problem, the first question I now ask are, what does the research say? What is the evidence? What information can we gather to determine if it will fit in different contexts?" End quote. Madam Moderator, this is exactly what needs to be done in order to base decisions on evidence. But what would it look like for us in the Caribbean region? Madam Moderator, let's take the problem of rising levels of diabetes. An analysis and data and data and trends reveals that there is a positive correlation between the rising levels of diabetes and high food imports. Suppose this leads a decision maker to propose the following potential courses of action. One, impose additional duty on certain imported foods. Two, stop imported foods. Three, show people how to use technology to increase food production for their own use and sale. An evidence-based approach will examine each potential courses of actions by asking a key question. Has such course of action proven to be effective for others in similar situations? The decision on whether actions one, two, or three, or some other course of actions is then taken based on the response given to this question. Sir Arthur Lewis, St. Lucia Nobel Laureate said, only good decisions are free. Bad ones always come at a cost, end quote. Madam Moderator, without evidence, policymakers must rely on intuition and conviction, their ideology, or at best, habits and traditions. The unavailability a lack of use, lack of use of timely and reliable data results in policy decisions that often go seriously wrong or astray and are likely to be abandoned, leading to the costly mistakes. Mistakes that stymie the economic development of the Caribbean region.
Ladies and gentlemen, that was the leader for the proposition, Ms. Sinead Taylor Lee, and she presented her argument in 10 minutes and 26 seconds. I will now like to invite the leader of the opposition, Ms. Rhonda Allen, who will have 10 minutes to present her case. When one storm can obliterate one island, an island state, or a number of island states in one hurricane season, how will we survive? How can we develop? How can we exist? Dr. Hubert Innes, Madam Moderator, my Honorable Judges, my fellow opponents, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. This evening, my esteemed colleague and I will address the folly of optimism of the moot. A moot that purports the decline in economic development in the Caribbean is due to the lack of evidence-based decision-making. Inherent to the moot, which formally states lack of evidence-based decision-making continues to stymie the economic development of the Caribbean region, is a denial of the potency of the geological and geopolitical forces amassed against our region. Oscar Wilde famously said that the basis of optimism is sheer terror, but a brave face denies us the necessary honesty of reality. The critical factors that affect our economic development are, sad to say, out of our hands, even if we make the best decisions. I will present four of these factors, while my colleague will present a further three. But first, it would be remiss, Madam Moderator, if I do not ensure that we both possess a mutual understanding of this evening's moot. For this reason, I will provide definitions for some key concepts found within. Evidence-based is defined by Oxford Dictionary as denoting an approach to medicine, education, and other disciplines that emphasizes the practical applications of the findings of the best available current research. Decision-making is defined by Oxford as the action or process of making important decisions. Cambridge University Press defines stymie as to prevent something from happening or someone from achieving a purpose. Economic development is defined by the same source as the process in which an economy grows or changes and becomes more advanced, especially when both economic and social conditions are improved. The text Caribbean Studies for Cape Examination by Mohammed defines Caribbean region as countries who share a common history of colonization and are geographically positioned on the Caribbean plate and or have their shores washed by the Caribbean Sea. Hence, the moot can now be restated. The continuous decline in economic development in the Caribbean region is due to the lack of the practical application of the findings of the best available current research when making important decisions. My colleague and I firmly oppose such a proposition. In fact, Madam Moderator, my colleague and I firmly believe that the continuous non-progressive malaise which affects the economy of the Caribbean countries are due to other larger causes, largely beyond the control of our decision makers. Consider first the wrath of the earth itself. Natural disasters, Madam Moderator, are a critical factor in our thrust for development. The Caribbean, it seems, is a magnet for tropical disturbances. Every other year we feel the brunt or scrapped effects of tropical storms and hurricanes. Let us look at the case of Dominica, nature island of the Caribbean. 2015 saw Dominica being drenched by tropical storm Erica, causing approximately 500 million US dollars in infrastructural damage. An entire village wrecked to the point where it was declared uninhabitable. This was followed two years later in 2017 by Hurricane Maria, which caused an estimated 930.9 million US dollars in damage. 
damage that spans every sector, agriculture, education, health, tourism, and housing. Madam Moderator, let us look at this logically. Hurricanes on the regular will thwart even the most well-planned development programs, even those that are based on evidence. Imagine having to relocate a thousand people, as was the case after Tropical Storm Erica. The money spent on housing, on repairing infrastructure, would have been used to improve the agricultural and tourism sectors, two of Dominica's main income earners. Madam Moderator, September 1, 2019, Category 5 Hurricane Dorian battered the Bahamas. According to Fox Business, the catastrophic hurricane left damages estimating 7 billion US dollars. A tourist haven now partly demolished. Reportedly, 70% of Grand Bahama was underwater. Let us bring this point home, Madam Moderator. Hurricane Hugo in 1989. According to Corps Commander's report, published on October 6, 1989, the passage of Hurricane Hugo left 98% of the island's buildings with minor damage. 50% of the island's buildings severely and extensively damaged, and 20% of the island's buildings totally destroyed. Hurricane Hugo caused approximately 645 million Eastern Caribbean dollars of damage. Coupled with the displacement of months rations to other countries, money used to repair our infrastructure could have been used to develop our economy and social conditions. What can our leaders do against such reckless wind? Madam Moderator, spanning 15 years after the passage of Hurricane Hugo were the volcanic eruptions. Volcanic eruptions which resulted in two-thirds of the island being pronounced uninhabitable. And the migration of more than 50% of the population to other countries. Factories, a cinema, the Caribbean's first medical school. Gone. Money which could have been used to develop our economy was used to rebuild our island. Note, not repair, but rebuild. When we are constantly rebuilding, where will the money for development come from? Madam Moderator, economic stagnation, factor number two, lack of exports from the Caribbean countries. According to the Observatory of Economic Complexity, in 2017, Dominica's imports valued 274 million US dollars. But exports valued 40.5 million US dollars. Antigua and Barbuda's imports valued 752 million US dollars. Compared to exports valued at 248 million US dollars. And our own Montserrat had imports valued at 14.3 million US dollars, but exports valued at 8.92 million US dollars. Madam Moderator, this is absurd. How can one expect the economy to develop if our countries have negative trade balances? Clearly representing the data, our money is being placed into the hands of these first world countries, hence why their economies continue to grow and our stagnate or decline. In fact, the member states of the Caribbean region should utilize na the natural resources in abundance around us for manufacturing. Why should countries like the United States, for example, package and sell genetically altered commodities, such as coconut water, while we allow ours to be wasted? Why should they be able to take such a commodity, which many may classify as Caribbean, and make so much profit off it? Why? Madam Marietta, the abandonment of administrative plans by previous political parties also contributes to the lack of economic development in the Caribbean region. For example, in 2014, here on Montserrat, the political party PDM was elected into office. All actions put in place by our previous party, MCAP, were seized. This included the construction of a new port on the plateau previously known as Gun Hill and the construction of a marina on the plateau previously known as Piper's Pond, with costs estimating 4 million Eastern Caribbean dollars. Madam Moderator, I must ask, where is the new port? And where is the marina? 
Money wasted, Madam Moderator. Money which could have been used to develop the economy here on Montserrat. The plateaus have been excavated for approximately five years. Madam Moderator, have you ever heard the maxim, united we stand, divided we fall? How I wish Caribbean countries would hear and understand the maxim, but most importantly, take actions to prevent our continual falling. So many attempts we have made at regional integration, so many setbacks with countries only to, willing to agree to that which benefits their populations. Take a look at the Caribbean Court of Justice, established since 2003 with the intent of ensuring that the laws of the Caribbean single market and economy are uniform and predictable. This important judicial instrument has only been accepted in its entirety by Barbados, Belize, Dominica and Guyana. What happened to the other CARICOM countries? Don't they realize the importance of the CCJ in creating a stable macroeconomic environment suitable for the attraction of foreign capital? Surely we understand that stability of expectation is a fundamental requirement for investment decisions. Further, Madam Moderator, we all agree that more capital investments by both foreign and local private sector enterprises is the cornerstone for economic growth. So why not provide the legal environment for such economic growth? Madam Moderator, in my discourse, I would have illuminated some of the factors which negatively impact the economic development of the Caribbean region. These factors are not linked to a lack of evidence-based decision-making, but rather our inability to sustain meaningful inter-regional relationships. If you are still not convinced, my colleague will rectify that lack of evidence-based decision-making is not the prime reason for the stymieing of the Caribbean country's economic development. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that was the second speaker for the opposition, Miss Rhonda Allen, and she presented in 10 minutes and 49 seconds. We will now continue our debate, and we will have the second speaker from the proposition, Ms. Ashanti Francis, and she will have seven minutes to make her presentation. Madam Moderator, for those who are yet to be convinced, here's three simple cases to enlighten them. First, let's take a look at the legalization and the decriminalization of cannabis. Madam Moderator, in several Caribbean islands, the, the criminalization of cannabis is still in full force. People are being stopped, searched, hunted down, and criminalized for as little as one cannabis seed. Madam Moderator, there is sufficient evidence to show that cannabis has a number of health and economic benefits. There isn't enough time to elaborate on all the benefits, so for now, I will focus on the economic benefits. The, the following are the evidence. The legal marijuana industry is making billions of dollars in sales and raising hundreds of millions of dollars in tax revenue for several American states. For example, in 2018, Colorado's legal pot sales topped $1.2 billion. They collected about $270 million in taxes. Now, compare that to the approximately $45 million they collected in tax on alcohol that same year. And compare that to the $100 million they earned in taxes before marijuana. And it's not just Colorado. California pulled in $345 million in 2018, and Washington, $376 million. New Frontier data 
a cannabis data website predicts the legalized cannabis market will grow to $25 billion by 2025. Guess what? The country that arrests 8.2 million people a year for marijuana is the largest producer of marijuana. Jamaica, the first Caribbean country on the United Nations top 10 list of marijuana producing countries is just number seven. And here's how it's working out financially for people who work for cannabis companies. The CEO of a cannabis company earns more than two and a half times the national average for CEOs. But it doesn't stop there. Research shows that the salaries for cannabis themed jobs grew more than 16% between 2017 and 2018, and jobs within the industry increased by 76%. Madam Moderator, weed has been decriminalized and legalized in America, Canada, and other parts of the world. Madam Moderator, the evidence of economic and health benefits is clear. It is time for us to make the decision and take action to do the same. If we wait this long, we'll lag behind, and before we know it, the advancement of this green goal will be at a whole new level, will be at a whole new level bringing health, wealth to individuals and countries, and we will have missed the gravy train. Madam Moderator, let's now take a look at crime and poverty. With a high level of unemployment and increasing poverty in several Caribbean countries comes persons participating in criminal activities. The increasing level of criminality has eroded confidence among investors. Madam Moderator, not only does crime cause human suffering, but as many reports demonstrate, it also causes the loss of those with skills or education who prefer to work in a safer environment. It changes for the worse the perception of nation's investment climate. Moreover, studies by the University of the West Indies and others show that crime also has a negative effect on social development by diverting limited resources away from health and education to security. Madam Moderator, nations easily become entangled in a vicious cycle that perpetuates this problem. Poverty causes crime and violence but which then further inhibits a country's growth and development, thus leading to more poverty, inequality, and crime. Madam Moderator, I can almost make opposition smiling and thinking she's making a case for us. But no, Madam Moderator, the point is, evidence shows that crime in the Caribbean can be reduced from an institutional level by supporting education, improving health facilities in impoverished areas. It is the failure to use this evidence which make it, when making decisions about investment in education, health, and even youth affairs that help to perpetuate a vicious cycle of failure in education, unemployment, poverty, crime, and the underdevelopment of our Caribbean region. On a side note, did you know that less than 15% of math teachers in my home country, Jamaica, are fully qualified to teach math? And did you know that right here in Montserrat, the students at the Montserrat Secondary School in sets one to three learn different things in maths? Yet, they are all asked to sit the same exact, exa same exact exam at CXE. You don't even need math to work out the evidence that's staring us right in our faces. We, the youth, are being set up to fail. The irony, Madam Moderator, we can neither get into higher education nor employment without both math and English. The result? underdevelopment of our human capital, unemployment, poverty, crime, and lower economic development of our beloved Caribbean region. Madam Moderator, we in the Caribbean need to do much better, but if we are to do better, we must learn from the best. My research has shown that three countries with the highest standard of living are Finland, Canada, and Denmark. Finland, who is number one, has the largest collection of statistics on both Finland and the world. Statistics Finland freely provides data for decision making and research. Madam Moderator, data is collected, used to make decisions that enhance education, health, the environment, and many more, leading to the top three countries being known as the best in the following categories. Most literate in the world, most human capital in the world, best healthcare system in the world, one of the lowest cancer mortality, second to Cyprus, best standard of living in the world. Madam Moderator, according to Damien Eisenhower Graves' 2017 study, 
published in the International Journal of Health Governance, the absence of a culture of decision making based on evidence pervades the public service of Caribbean islands. Like most of you, in fact, like most people on earth, I am no statistician. I have difficulty even saying the word. But like most of you, I strongly believe not using the evidence, facts, data, whatever you choose to call it, to base decision making makes no sense. For not making decisions based on objective evidence can only present an obstacle to improve living standards in our Caribbean region. Ladies and gentlemen, that was Ms. Ashanti Francis, the second speaker for the proposition, and she made her case in seven minutes and nine seconds. We will now invite Ms. Beyonce Osborne, who is the second speaker for the opposition, and she will have seven minutes to present her argument. Madam Moderator, it is puerile to stand here and state that such an unpalatable economic state of affairs in the Caribbean region is due to a lack of evidence-based decision-making. I believe my colleague has made it abundantly clear that there are factors which have an indelible impact on our attempts to further our economic development. I will continue in the same vein and convince you beyond a shadow of a doubt that a lack of evidence-based decision-making is not a factor stymieing our economic development as our learned, experienced Caribbean leaders ensure decision-making is founded on statistical evidence. I will forward three reasons for this continual stagnation of our Caribbean economies. One, overdependence on one industry. Two, vulnerability of industry to market forces and natural disasters. And three, brain drain. Madam Moderator, Caribbean nations' over-dependence on one industry, for example, bananas, or maybe tourism, is another factor as to why our Caribbean economy is not growing. Madam Moderator, the banana trade has been crucial to the economies of the Caribbean region and was established over 50 years ago by the British. According to the Fair Trade Foundation 2016, 50% of the population on the Windward Islands are employed by banana trade, and it contributes 50% of the total export revenue. The banana industry provides crucial foreign exchange for investment in social and economic development. Tropical Storm Kirk made its way through the region during late September 2018, and in early October, the St. Lucian Ministry of Agriculture estimated the aftermath to 80% damage of the nation's banana crops. St. Vincent and the Grenadines is another promising agricultural country, which has experienced a decline in its primary crop, bananas, due to the dismantling of the special European Union access arrangements. Tourism, Madam Moderator. Islands such as the Bahamas, the British Virgin Islands, Barbados, Anguilla, and Aruba depend heavily on tourism for income. Tourism is one of the Caribbean's major economic sectors, with 25 million visitors contributing 49 billion U.S. dollars towards the area's gross domestic product in 2013, which represented 14 percent of its total GDP. The Caribbean is often described as the most tourism-dependent region in the world. In terms of employment, 11.3 percent of the region's jobs depend on tourism either directly or indirectly. Caribbean islands tend to invest a lot of money into tourism, and ever so often a hurricane or any sort of natural disaster can come in and swoop away everything. Hotels gone, golf courses gone, roads, airports, electricity, water and beaches, all gone, just like that. Madam Moderator, as we have shown, there are factors that are beyond evidence-based decision-making. Hurricanes random, EU-based arrange arrangements out of our control. 
However, Madam Moderator, tourism benefits the Caribbean in its development of infrastructure. Airports, roads, and sports facilities are built to accommodate tourists, and we enjoy them as well. Secondly, it contributes to the national treasury, monies to help providers with needed social services. Madam Moderator, it seems as though the majority of the Caribbean islands are becoming very dependent on tourism. Yes, you may think that it is a boost in the economy, but really, if majority of the islands are engaging in one and only one economy booster, don't you think benefits would be low due to the fact that these islands are competing for one thing, tourists? Just imagine, a family of five dependent on one salary, and it is expanded by twins, but the salary remains the same. Will that one salary be able to sustain the entire family? I think not. My moderator, it is the same situation with tourism in the Caribbean. My moderator, let us now take a look at evidence-based decisions that have not yielded the desired result. Let us start right here at home with geothermal explorations. Madam Moderator, the British government has invested in excess of 20 million EC dollars in geothermal energy in Montserrat. Why? Because the expected Montserrat have been able to generate energy due to the fact that volcanoes are located here. But if you look at it, Madam Moderator, you can clearly see what? It has been almost seven long years since new ground was broken for this investment, and up to this very day, it has not been of any significance to the citizens of this island. Nevis and Dominica, same thing. Just think about it, money wasted right there. Madam Moderator, even with the best evidence that geothermal can radically change Montserrat's economy, because we lack our own funds to build the power plant, we cannot capitalize on this natural gold mine. Another such failed enterprise is that of the loss of a vibrant, income-earning, job-providing industry, the Dominica coconut products. Based on evidence from scientists, said enterprise was sold by the Dominican government in 1995 to Colgate Palmolive. Subsequent to that colossal error, the American company needed just one excuse, which came in the form of Tropical Storm Erica to pack up shop, leaving 94 Dominicans jobless and the country minus one solid income earner. Madam Moderator, let us take a look at the final nail in the coffin, read the stagnation of the Caribbean economic development brain drain. Thousands leave our shores every year. According to the report on Caribbean Skilled Migration 2002, 356,361 skilled professionals left the Caribbean to settle in the United States between 1990 to 1998, and 44,108 migrated to Canada in between 1990 to 1996. The Migration Report of 2019 notes that these figures have increased exponentially from 2000 to 2018. These figures prove what has been said, that the Caribbean's biggest export is its human resource. Imagine that, Madam Moderator, our skilled tradesmen, health, education, legal, along other categories of professionals are leaving our shores in droves for the greener pastures of the United States of America, Canada, Australia, England, and Abu Dhabi. When these human resources are gone, who is left to build our countries? Who is left to develop our scant natural resources? Who, Madam Moderator, who? Madam Moderator, even those of us on this platform will be leaving this island sooner rather than later. Madam Moderator, it is with total conviction that I say the Caribbean region's continued lack of advancement in both its economic and social conditions is not caused by lack of evidence-based decision-making. The opposition rests temporarily. Ladies and gentlemen, that was Miss Beyonce Osborne, and she presented her case in seven minutes and 30 seconds.
That brings us to the end to our prepared speeches, and we will now be moving on to section two of our debate, which is our rebuttal. And just a reminder, this, oh, sorry, I made an error earlier. I did say it was for 50 points, but I stand corrected. It is a maximum of 160 points, and we will now grant them five minutes of complete silence so I crave your indulgence so that they can prepare their rebuttal speeches. Timekeeper, can you please set five minutes? And that five minutes begins now.
our five minutes is up. I would just like to remind you of the moot this evening, and it is the lack of evidence-based decision-making continues to stymie the economic development of the Caribbean region. Now, both our proposition and opposition have made their arguments. We're now moving on to the rebuttal, which carries a maximum of 160 points. And each speaker will be allowed five minutes to make their rebuttal presentation. And I would now like to invite the first speaker of the opposition, Ms. Rhonda Allen, who will now come and make her case. Let's encourage her as she comes. Madam Moderator, areas presented by the proposition constitute only a small part of our economies. However, we have shown that external market, market forces are of extreme importance due to our economy's size and lack of Caribbean unity. The proposition fails to understand that no amount of evidence or data can predict when hazards such as hurricanes and earthquakes will directly impact us and destroy our infrastructure and our development activities. You can't tell a hurricane don't come. And if the hurricane come, you can't tell it where to go. If my colleagues had looked at the evidence, they would have realized that by and large, our Caribbean political climate is stable. Antigua, for example, has had their Labour Party for two terms. And Dominica has had their Labour Party for 20 years. Additionally, if my colleagues did adequate research, they would have seen that all Caribbean countries have an education development plan. Montserrat, for instance, has one, spanning 2012 to 2020. Madam Moderator, the proposition brings up marijuana. For example, Antigua and Barbuda has legalized marijuana. Now students, of the Antigua and Barbuda economy, go to school with marijuana and smoke it on campus. Is this what they go to school to do? To smoke or to learn the lesson? Which one? Tell me. Research has also proven that marijuana can introduce toxins into your respiratory system. So instead of thinking about the economic benefits of this, why not think about how it would detrimize us as the people? And then more money would have to go into hospitals and health programs, right? Madam Moderator, elaborating on my colleague's point of the geothermal plant is not that we didn't do evidence-based decision-making. Evidence-based decision-making was done. It's the fact that we lack the funding for such activities. They dug and they found something, but we don't have the money for the geothermal plant. Hence why the, the boat for the geothermal stuff come, pack up shop and gun. Additionally, Madam Moderator, as I said previously, we lacked the legal environment to attract investors and regionally, regional investors and international investors, that is. Madam Moderator, the opposition rests its case.
That was Miss Rhonda Allen, and she presented her rebuttal in three minutes and 17 seconds. Now we will hear our rebuttal from the first speaker of the proposition, Ms. Shanae Taylor-Lee, and she has five minutes to make her argument. Madam Moderator, countries in the region and the international development assistance agencies continue to formulate development plans and investment projects without due consideration about the risk posed by natural disasters. Yet, the recent, natural, the recent disaster that has affected our region serves as a reminder that sustainable development cannot be attained without mitigating hazard risks. Madam Moderator, significant progress towards economic development can only be made by including hazard assessments and vulnerability analysis in the development planning process. The, pro the project appraisal process must include a cost-benefit analysis as well as appropriate loss reduction and mitigation measures. We know that hurricanes are going to come, yes, but to put policies, the evidence has shown that these hurricanes are going to hit the islands in the Caribbean. We need to look at the evidence which shows how we're supposed to, for example, build our infrastructure. We know hurricanes coming, so let's build our infrastructure properly based on the evidence that is handed to us about these natural disasters. My, my worthy opponents also stated brain drain. Madam Moderator, evidence has shown that yes, persons are leaving the island of Montserrat. But here on the island of Montserrat, we are seeing that our teachers and facilitators and policymakers are not basing their evidence on what is going on. For example, the maths and English here on the island. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that was the first speaker for the proposition, Ms. Shanae Taylor-Lee, and she presented her rebuttal in two minutes and five seconds. This brings us to the end of our debate, and at this time, I would ask our auditors to collect the score sheets from our judges. And once this has been done, we will ask our judges to vacate for a little bit so that we could have an open discussion here. So whilst they're doing that, I would just like to remind you of the mood for this evening. It was the lack of evidence-based decision-making continues to stymie the economic development of the Caribbean region. And I just wanted to reiterate that so that when we get to the discussion part that you will be fully aware as to what you're coming up to speak about. The judges were looking in the main debate for soundness of points logical development, presentation, that was the audibility and clarity, posture and personality, the command of language, 
and that section carried a total of 100 points. We also had a rebuttal section, which they were marking, and we had team coordination, general analysis of debate, the recall of points, the ability to refute the points, spontaneity, and that section carried a total of 160 points. We also had two judges who will be um, judging the best speaker for this evening. So they are also tabulating their scores. And just a reminder of the times that we had um, for the debate. Coming up first, we had Ms. Shanae Taylor-Lee, and she was the first speaker for the proposition, and she presented her case in 10 minutes and 26 seconds. We, had, we then went on to the first speaker from the opposition, Ms. Rhonda Allen, and she presented in 10 minutes and 49 seconds. We had the second speaker from the proposition, Ms. Ashanti Francis, who went next, and she presented in seven minutes and nine seconds, followed by the second speaker from the opposition, Ms. Beyonce Osborne, and she presented in seven minutes and 30 seconds. And so that you know, the speakers were all allowed an additional 30 seconds before being penalized. So they had a maximum for the first speaker was 10 minutes, second speaker had seven minutes, but they would have been granted um, 30 seconds after for, before being penalized. Our rebuttal times, which I mentioned not too long ago, first up we had our opposition speaker, Ms. Rhonda Allen, in three minutes and 17 seconds, and then Ms. Shanae Taylor-Lee, who presented her rebuttal in two minutes and five seconds. And once again, the mood was the lack of evidence-based decision-making continues to stymie the economic development of the Caribbean region. I will begin the open discussion as soon as the judges have left the auditorium. Our head judge for this evening was Mistress Angela Greenaway and the best speaker head judge, Miss Angela Eswick. The main part of the debate was soundness of points, which carried a maximum of 35 points. They were looking for accuracy of points, if they were substantiating by giving examples, giving quotation, statistics, and we had the outline of their structure. Did they adequately explore the topic? We also had logical development, which carried a maximum of 20 points. Were the arguments developed along logical lines and presented in a well-ordered manner? We had audibility and clarity. Were they loud? Were they distinct when they were speaking? Were they fluent? Their posture and personality, was it charismatic in delivery? What about their body language? Did they have good posture and eye contact? Their command of language, were they comfortable? 
Did they use correct grammar? What about their vocabulary and expression? Okay, our judges have left the building and I want to take this time out and ask each and every one of you to give all of our debaters a round of applause for putting on such a very good show this afternoon. All of our speakers did exceptionally well and I can tell you as a past debater, um, I know that it is really not easy to come up here, especially when it comes to the rebuttal part. part of it there are lots of nerves and I just want to congratulate each and every one of you and tonight it's just about who presented the stronger argument because all of you did excellent jobs okay so ladies and gentlemen the auditorium we are now open for discussion both sides the proposition and the opposition gave some very fruitful arguments Right, and I would just like to encourage you, there's a mic in the middle, I think I saw Alfie with it. And so you can feel free to come forward or just raise your hand and she can provide you with the mic so that you could either congratulate, give constructive criticism because we know that next year we have, the MCC will be participating in the Leeward Islands debating competition and so this is the time that you can constructively give them some, um, some feedback and let them know what they've done well, what they can improve on, improve on, sorry, and how they can go about doing it. And also, if you have any thoughts on the topic, which was the lack of evidence-based decision-making continues to stymie the economic development of the Caribbean region. So feel free to come forward, raise your hand and grab a mic, and let us start this conversation. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, definite congratulations to all of the speakers tonight. Uh, for me, Rhonda was my um, best speaker. I don't know if the judges will agree, <laughs> but I thought she was quite articulate and she made me a believer. Uh, overall, I would just like to say that I hope they work on the rebuttal side in terms of take good notes as you're listening to the, um, the other person present. And definitely you have to be well read outside of the areas that you presented so that you can have a lot more substance when you come back for the rebuttal. But I thought it was an excellent discussion. Um, I was hoping somebody from uh, the proposition would have just talked about the simple fact that they all use data to prove their point, you know, and that would have been a, a clear way just to reinforce that none of this, this conversation wouldn't even be happening if you weren't <laughs> using data. And I think that was something that they, they missed. Uh, but very well, uh, good discussion. And congratulations to statistics. Thank you. Anyone else? I see someone going, yes. Good night. Good night. All right, overall, great debate. Um, as a former debater, every time these come up, we get super excited, and so great to see you come out. And I also understand the time preparation was limited for this, so to consider that you may have had a few weeks, and the quality of debate, really commend yourself, please. All right? Uh, a few tricks from the trick bag. I think that most of you use a, a kind of what we call punchy technique to bring your points across. Um, but I remember Miss Yasmin White always talking about managing your voice modulation. And a lot of times we've lost that Leeward Islands, in my opinion, because we, went, we always went with our speeches very strong. And some of our competitors are really good at actually bringing a soft point, but the soft point being very strong, uh, what we call an emotional argument. Uh, so whether it's your first speaker or your second speaker, someone in there you want to encourage 
or, or, or try to make sure that you make an emotional appeal, even though we're talking about statistics and data. You probably had the opportunity to do it with the natural disaster arguments, and you could have brought a personal story or record from somebody talking about that, and that would have hit people personally and emotionally, and that normally gets a lot of points, right? The other thing is, you did a good job of bringing up context that is relevant to where you're hosting. A lot of times when we're debating against Antigua or St. Martin, we try to make sure we bring a statistic or something that is in our favor from their country. In this instance, I think it was the opposition that talked about politics, PDM, MCAP, perfect. That is exactly what you want to do because it's relevant to the time uh, and it makes everybody in the crowd smile and, and, and it's relevant. So again, if you're competing against a foreign team, you want to make sure you include some of the data or statistics or the incidents in their countries in your argument. So good job. You mentioned stymie, and I think we didn't emphasize, I think the trick to winning this debate would have been how do you manage the definition of that word? And a lot of times when we're defining our mood or redefining the mood, you just say the definition from the book, but you really want to reframe it that is in your best interest, right? Uh, at first glance, the proposition seems to be the stronger argument, but then after a while, you see that the opposition has more substantiation. So your proposition needs to really limit by using the definition of that word to make your side stronger. Finally, with the rebuttals, um, the biggest misconception with rebuttals is that it is not pre-prepared. It is pre-prepared. Your opening statement most times is pre-prepared and your closing statement most times is pre-prepared. And as you prepare your speech, you know what the other side strengths and points potentially are. You don't need to necessarily make five points in your opposition. Um, I think, Ms. Taylor, you were going down up the, the math point and we were saying finish it. That was a good point you could have presented, right? But your opening and your closing for your rebuttal is always pre-prepared. And then you're just looking for them to give you one or two things that you honestly pre-prepared as well. So if you know that natural disasters was one of the arguments they potentially would make, you would have a, a potential arguments list. And then when you hear it, you just confirm what they say, what counterpoint you already have in the bag, and then you put that down on your list to present. So a lot of times it seems like you're up there writing a whole speech, but you actually know, if they say natural disaster, this is what I'm going to say. If they say corruption, this is what I'm going to say. Uh, but overall, again, great points, just little tips and tricks. Um, Mrs. Kebe, we're looking good considering the the time of preparation, but we're looking forward to more of these and, and your upcoming competition at Leeward Islands. Good job. Thank you. And there you, got, you had some little tips and tricks because sometimes when you read the mood, you may automatically think that one side is strong, but preparation is always key. And as was alluded, once you read it and you're doing your research, you can kind of actually know what the other side is coming with so you could prepare in advance and then you can use that uh, you have a checklist that you can use to prepare your rebuttal it doesn't always work i must say to you because you must be the one that's preparing your speech you must be well read you must do the research any other comments coming from the audience even if it is just to commend the debaters. Some. Whilst they're getting the mic set, it is also important that you try your best to connect with the audience as best as possible. And relevancy, relevancy in the fact that we are living in the Caribbean, and so when you're bringing up your points, not only from the country that you're debating in, you could even draw references from the other side. So say for instance, you're coming up against a country like Antigua, you can bring points from Antigua and so forth. The mic is ready, so I'll allow Honorable Hogan. Thank you, Madam Chair. I wanted to congratulate and salute the debaters, but I, I really want to also restrict my comments to the substance of the moot 
the lack of evidence-based decision-making continues to stymie the economic development of our Caribbean region. And in the heart of that question, it's very, very, very real in the Caribbean. The fact is, however, that um, the availability of evidence or the deficit in the availability of evidence is reducing with the advent of computers and satellites and so on. So we are now able to have better information um, on which to make decisions. But it's a real subject that was very heartened to see the effort by the students in giving attention to it. The proposition mentioned one of the items among others, which is corruption, political ideology, habit, habits and traditions. But corruption has emerged in this 21st century as one of the most uh, problematic issues that uh, tend to undermine evidence-based decision-making. I found that was a, a very good and powerful observation. I also would like to, of course, extend my compliments to the opposition and their a very articulate uh, way they handle the question of the vulnerability of the region. Again, that is probably, after corruption, the second most important issue facing the Caribbean in terms of the vulnerability and natural disasters. And indeed, a single uh, natural disaster can wipe out the economic growth of our islands overnight, within hours, and that has happened. So congratulations for your uh, delightful, in-depth research into these matters. And, and I find that um, you guys have improved a lot since our days at MSS. And like the fact that you can engage the audience and the rapport you had Totally excellent. Thank you. Indeed. One of the speakers mentioned that it's beyond the grasp of our leaders and our decision makers. Do you believe that that is indeed the case? They spoke about natural disasters and different setbacks that would be affecting. Is it really an unfair playing field? That's the question there. The floor is still open. Good evening. I just want to, first of all, congratulate the statistics department as well as the community college. The debaters this evening have some fantastic voices which needs to be trained. I believe we have started early and I'm hoping that at the college it will continue so that they have very good practice from now right through to debate 2020. So for me, what I would like to encourage Mrs. KB is to continue the practice. Um, also, I'm pleased to see that we have some debaters here who started public speaking in, private, in primary school. So, again, congratulations and all the best. There's someone to the back asking for the mic. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, Mrs. Kaby. As the principal of the Montserrat Community College, I couldn't leave here without saying um, a very delightful congratulation to the four young ladies on the stage. Um, as usual in Mrs. Kaby's Frank style. When the Department of Statistics came with the idea, having planned it outside of the Montserrat Community College and presenting this challenge to the students to deliver the debate in a matter of three weeks, my initial reaction was to say no, because I thought in all fairness, it would not have given the students sufficient time and also the fact that the school was not part of, the college was not part of the planning. Nevertheless, 
I passed it to the lecturers who were dealing with the debating society and the students took on the challenge. So I want to say heartiest congratulations. You represented yourself extremely well. It is obvious that you got very good support by the lecturers who assisted you and other parties. And I'm very, very happy for you that you were able to come through even in this short time frame. Yes, there are things that you can improve on. I think that in general, sometimes your points got lost because you were mindful of the time. So you were going a bit quickly and some words were not very clear. So I think that needs to be worked on. I also think that um, in preparing the speeches, you should give a little more time to actual delivery so that you don't go too close to the 10 minutes so that you're actually going over the seven minutes. I think maybe the speeches need to be tailored a little down so that in terms of fright and other things that it will compensate. Um, I think sometimes that is what affected the length of the delivery. But girls, you did a wonderful job. I love you. Thank you, Mrs. KB. And just shedding light that it was only three weeks worth of preparation, you guys did indeed do an excellent, excellent job. We have a hand in the front. I know you think I'm talking about the debate. Ah. I'm telling all here, we are selling drink outside to raise some funds for the <laughs> debating club. Please go buy a drink or two. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you. This is all in support of the Monstrat Community College as well. Yes. yes. So let us support the Monstrat Community College. And I do hope that even after hearing the debates, I know that the statistics department asked for a contribution. I know the entry was free. They asked for a contribution, but feel free to give a little bit more because our debaters did indeed give us something that was worth it. Hello, one help to collect the money. Hey, good night. The, I'd yes. like to first start off by thanking the statistics department for putting on this debate and to congratulate the debaters. Because as pointed out by Mr. Scaby and other speakers, it's only three weeks. And three weeks is a short time. By the time you spend time to prepare the speech, you have a few days to go to delivery and to get the time and to all of that. For, so, for the students to deliver such an impressive thing in that short time, says a lot for the upcoming LIDC. And then I would like to also make some, some comments. One of them that people congratulate the four girls. So these four girls, there's no boys on the team. <laughs> so I would hope that the college would <laughs> make an effort to talk to the young men and to get them and involved them. so we have a better gender balance. <laughs> but all, all in all, it was a very good debate for the first time. They made some, some things that can be improved, which I'll talk mm -hmm. to them after I won't do it publicly, but there are certain things that can be improved. But you asked an important question, is it lack of decision-making that's actually stymieing the decision? The economic development. You must also understand that people have emotions. So sometimes the data might tell you, maybe there's a volcanic activity, you should not build your capital here. But if people are insisting that they go there, even though the data is saying this, and people have an emotional attachment to something, you still have that to deal with. So even though the data says one thing, you're still in the end dealing with human beings and that could have been something that was discussed. Thank you. Thank you. Whilst the light is in the audience, just raise your hands, please. Okay, yes, someone has the mic. Yes, Mr. Castle, yes, good evening. Are you ready? Yes, I am. Okay. I just want to join with the others to congratulate also the statistics department as well as the students and likewise my, with my colleague I also want to say I want to see some gentlemen um, with the ladies 
overall a very good performance from the students. But in the sense of the other issues to raise, as Sammy said, I think we'll do it privately. But as usual, I notice traditionally our rebuttals are on the weaker side. And that comes with a lot of practice. And the forum for having debates is not something you would have on a regular basis. But something I think back to my childhood. Um, growing up, my brother and I used to always just debate. We'd find topics. If even it's just a blade of grass, we'd find ways of debating issues on, on, on that topic. And then, as we progress through life, in Rotaract, we used to use this um, thing from out of the UK. It was a 60 seconds. You have to speak on a topic for 60 seconds without hesitation, deviation, or repetition. And that provides a good basis for building your skill in terms of, um, especially with rebuttals. You don't have to wait for a forum like this with a full formal debate. You can just do, even just standing on the side of the road. With a friend, you have a few minutes. You can, you can, you can engage in an exercise like that. And that will develop the skills, especially with regard to rebuttals. But overall, you know, I just want to say, I really do feel very good about the standard that has um, been put forward here to this evening, so much in advance of the actual um, Leeward Islands debate. And I think I'm, I'm really holding my hat up for winning um, the, the Leeward Islands debate, guys, because at this level of performance now, I'm looking forward to a win. I don't, I, I don't think you should be looking at losing, winning. And you have to do whatever is necessary to keep up the level of performance and to achieve the final goal, which I think is winning the Leeward Islands debate. And I also want to go back to say special thanks for the statistics department, because even in terms of the mood, it's making the, 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 the formal note, the use of data, which is what the statistical department is there for. And I think that was a very good seller of a um, of method that the department is using to show or justify their functionality as a government department. And I think that was very, very smart from whoever came from that slant. It's a very good move. And so overall, just like to thank everyone and congratulate all those that are associated with this exercise. Thank you. And yes, it's very important that we continue to practice the Leeward Islands debating competition will be held in Monstrat next year. And we really do want to win, 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 and bring home the trophy. And so in doing that, you need to practice. And at this point, I know we said that they must try their best to practice, even if it is just amongst themselves and at the college. But I would like to challenge individuals other organization, NGOs, there are lots of persons here. Speak to Mistress KB and see what you can do to either assist the debaters or put on public forums because sometimes you practice, and I'm very sure that most of them practice their speeches and they were within the time limit. But when you come to stand in front of an audience, there's lights on you, there are nerves going, going all around. So then it's a different atmosphere altogether. And so if we put on more public debates, get them accustomed to the format and so forth, I think that they would only get better. They can only get better. So let's try and get that done. Speak to Mrs. KB. Thank you very much. I want to also add my congratulations to the level of the debate that we had tonight from the four ladies. I am sorry, gentlemen, but the ladies are doing it. And of course, we'll encourage our young boys. I want to agree with Thandi that it is something we can start within our organizations and we do not have to wait for something like this. However, I congratulate the Statistics Department for hosting this debate tonight. And I also want to make a commitment to next year's debate for our Leeward Islands that we would not wait until the last minute to raise funds, but it is something that the government of Montserrat can invest in because it raises our national pride. Ladies, Montserrat Technical, Co I'm sorry, Montserrat Community College and Statistics Department, thank you very much for such a lovely evening. It augurs well for our country. It augurs well 
for our youth. I salute you tonight. You have done us well. Indeed, thank you. We have a hand to the front. Good evening, everybody. I would just like to congratulate you four ladies. Y'all were awesome. Um, three weeks, y'all did very well. Um, I know what it's like to prep under pressure because last year for LIDC, we had to do it. And I believe that if you guys continue practicing going into LIDC 2020, we will win without a doubt. And um, just one tip, to help the eye contact, when you're practicing, look in the mirror. So the more you look at yourself, the better the eye contact gets. All right. Thank you. Anyone else? Do you think that in the Caribbean we are over dependent on one product and this can perhaps be a cause to our lack of development? Can we partner together with other Caribbean islands? What are your thoughts on that? This was something that, this was a point that was raised by one of our debaters. So feel free to even speak about and help them to expound. Do, do you think that they expounded on their points well enough? Is there any other route that they could have taken? Um, I just want to make um, one comment as it relates to the, I think both the first speakers, they went over a little bit on their time, and when they saw the indicator to say that they were out of time, you could sense that they automatically became nervous, and that all comes with preparation. If you know your speech, you'll be able to know where to cut off, because it just, it's just a technique. Sometimes you just skip a few sentences and get straight to the conclusion, and no one would even know, just a natural flow. So don't let the audience, the audience does not have to know that, oh, oh my, I'm going over time a little bit. Yeah, so just skip a few sentences, and that's just a little technique, something that you can work on as well. And that all comes with knowing your speech. I think someone mentioned that most times you know your introduction, you know your conclusion. Right? Any other comments? I want to believe, though, um, I don't have the list of names here, but I recall when I was given the names for the debaters, I believe that there were some male persons who would have assisted in the preparations. Am I correct? I looked at the names. I'm not too privy with the names, but I do know that even though the males aren't on stage here, I want to believe that they would have assisted at some point in preparation for the debate. Another point that was raised was that in the Caribbean, um, we we're speaking about on, on level playing fields, that our imports are quite higher than our exports. And this in itself, because we do not have the resources, or the claim is that we do not have enough resources, and this is one of the reasons why our economic development is being stymied. Is that the case? Is there anything that we can do to combat that? Any more congratulatory messages to our debaters? Any more tips and tricks? I see a lot of persons who I know have a lot to share, even if it is just to register your commitment to assisting them, just say publicly that, um, I know some of you may not want to give all of your comments here, but even if it is just to stand to say that I pledge my support 
to the Monstrap Community College, and I'll be speaking to you and contacting you soon. Even that will be appreciated at this point. Yes, um, since no one else is um, saying anything else, there was just something else which um, crossed my mind. Attendance at these types of functions. Um, I keep saying in, in, in a different forum that we have to encourage more of our young people to attend these types of functions. It would have been nice to have some of the, the secondary school students here as well as um, even the primary school. The earlier you start exposing children to this type of um, activities, it's the better. Um, I was pleased last night to see an increased turnout at the football stadium to support uh, Montserrat, despite the outcome, but I wouldn't get into that. But the thing I really would love to see is more persons attending these types of functions and it'll be even better for the debaters when you have large crowds so they get accustomed to debating in front of a larger audience. So if each person who knew about this would encourage 10 persons to come, at least I think we'll be more than the about 100 persons who showed up here this evening and I think that is important to encourage more persons to be involved in this and um, to get the younger ones exposed and involved in this type of positive activity. Thank you. Thank you. And before you hand over the mic, I would just like to ask you one question. Um, I want to believe that this is being streamed live. And my understanding, I think one of the persons who spoke previously, they spoke about technological advancement what are your thoughts on that? Do you believe that because persons have access to these things um, via the online medium could be the reason why they're not attending? Well, the thing is, it is how we're using the technology to our benefit. If more persons are watching a particular or using a particular medium, we'd have to use the statistical information <laughs> and then target the audience in terms of how we go about trying to encourage more persons to attend these types of functions. And one of the things that the statistics department normally, that they do, is to do a survey to find out why maybe there are not so many persons here. So that's another um, technique that could be utilized to identify what is the um, weakness, why we're not having large numbers at this and other types of forum like this. And then you do the targeting, the, um, the targeting the market that you're, or the audience that you're trying to get at these types of functions. That's just my quick take. Okay. I'm just going to mention um, Dr. Sami and Narissa only because they, they spoke previously. And speaking about technology, how can we utilize technology to combat um, economic, this, this time of our economic development, if, if at all? Only because you spoke before, so everyone knows that you're here. So if we're speaking about technology, we expect to hear something. So while you think about that, I see someone else with the mic. Yes. I heard someone allude to the fact that this has been streamed live. And I am in a begging mode. So if anybody who is watching, if you're in America <laughs> or Canada or the UK, we desperately need funds. Because I'm sure I heard our moderator say as well that we are supposed to be hosting LIDC 2020. And there's no way that we can raise all of that funds in Montserrat. We can have lots of debates and get lots of less than 10% of your earnings and it will never add up. So please, for those of you who are overseas, send us your money, carry out some fundraising in your area and help us, help us. Help us. I'm begging. 
I totally agree. So you can contact the Montserrat Community College, speak with Mistress KB, and let her know exactly how you can assist um, financially to the debate because there are costs involved and it is not cheap hosting a debate. I believe as the host country, we would be responsible for the debaters, and I think it's five debaters they would have to pay for um, accommodation and so forth. So let's ensure that we assist the Montserrat Community College and Montserrat to ensure that we're able to host, and not only host, host it properly and to the best of our ability. Because the LIDC began here in Montserrat, and every time it comes home, we must ensure that we let others know that this is where the home of LIDC is, and they're expecting quality. Yes? Any other comments? I see someone waving from the back. Good evening, yes. everyone. I just want to compliment those beautiful young ladies for such a fantastic performance and I will be very biased to say that I am delighted that one of my assistants from Family Reading Time is on the team. Well done Ashanti. <laughs> and this just goes to show that it begins from the primary level. So for the primary school teachers who are here, I think I saw, um, I think the principal from the St. Augustine spoke earlier, and I do hope, I think that St. Augustine has a program with public speaking going on currently, and we just want to encourage from primary levels, let's just encourage them to public speak, get up in public and speak, discuss topics openly, so when they reach to these levels, it would be something that they are comfortable with. I think by now the judges would have, no? Sorry. I'm just going to ask someone to just have a little check on them, because perhaps they're thinking that they can't come back in. So can someone please just check on them while we continue our open discussion? And I think the mic went right to the back. I can't really see, but I think I, am I correct? No, no, no. Bendy dear, the judges are not quite ready for us yet, so we're just going to oh. have a little music so that you can rest your voice. Thank you very much. So we'll have a little brief intermission while the judges deliberate. Please, during this time, folks, don't forget to support the fundraising of the Munchak Community College students. They're selling refreshments On as well outside. as drinks.
speakers seated once again our proposition and our opposition and our judges are back and the moment we are all we've all been waiting for so without much further ado I would like to invite mistress Angela Greenaway who will be providing the results giving some feedback she was the head judge she'll be providing some feedback as well as giving us the scores Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Madam um, Moderator. Before I give the actual scores for the debate, just want to give some feedback from our, our judges. We want to thank the debating teams for their presentations this evening. It's clear that they understood the required format and uh, it wasn't boring. We had some effective opening quotations. Our main positive that we took away from the debates was that the debaters had a good command of the language. They had some good rhetorical questions. They used the local examples. And at different times, they were able to personalize the different issues. You know, there was some use of good humor and that sort of thing. So that helped with the debate. Some areas that we felt needed a little bit of improvement was that for us, the main issue was that there was very little focus on the use of statistics, which was the basis of the moot itself. There was no definition of statistics. You know, we have the different ranges of statistics. You have economic statistics, social statistics, very important, the census, you know, all of these things that gives us so much information. So we expected to hear a little bit more about the content of what this evidence-based decision-making would be about. What are some of the data sets that would be required for good decision-making? So we thought that you know, there may have been a focus on the fact that in the Caribbean, either we don't have enough data or that our um, data collection is not a priority. There was that reference to uh, countries that have good data collection, like Finland and some, some of those other countries. But that wasn't really developed then to show, well, based on you know, their collection of these different data sets and how they use these data sets, how then that helped in the decision making. There was some use of statistics. They were quoted, but there were no sources for these quotations. So the, quote, so the sources for the statistics that were given were not cited. So in many instances, figures were just called out without much basis um, for that. One, there's so much information that could have been used to show the, how the evidence base, how these data sets are used, you know, like in advancements in medicine, technology from the use of the data. The whole issue of economic development as well, it was defined, but it didn't really go, go much further than that. And I, we don't think that there was then enough link between the um, achievement of economic development and the use of the evidence or the statistics that would support economic development. One area of major concern is the rebuttal. The rebuttal needs quite a bit of work. In our view, uh, no one seemed to be taking much notes while others were speaking and maybe um, 
in the future, it needs to be part of the preparatory work that some thought needs to be given to the information that may come forward from opponents because then you're usually preparing both sides of the debate anyway and then you can sort of you know preempt some of the issues that would come forward in your rebuttal. The important point in a rebuttal is to use the full time slot that's allotted for the rebuttal. So we have five minutes so as close to the five minutes as possible um, should be should be utilized. That being said, the points for the debate, for the main, for the debate itself, the proposition, 618.5 point, point points, the opposition, 718 points, rebut, rebut, rebuttal, Proposition 166 points and opposition 227 points, giving a total of 784.5 points for the proposition and 945 points for the opposition. Thank you, Thank you Mrs. Greenaway. And congratulations to the opposition team who were the winners for this evening. But before we leave, we would like to in invite Ms. Angela Eswick, who, were, who was the judge for the best speaker. Good evening, debaters. Good evening, audience. Mistress Kimona, Daniel Bourne, and I have had the pleasant but equally important responsibility of adjudging the best speaker in this evening's debate. Now, what that meant for us was that we had to listen with extremely keen ear and observe with particularly keen eye. This we did for each of the four debaters against preset criteria. That criteria being 15 points each for audibility and clarity, articulation, persuasiveness, flu fluency, and body language, 10 points each for voice modulation and command of material, and five points for eye contact. Now to facilitate your embracing of our decision, which will be final, I will briefly share with you our focus for each of the criteria just mentioned. Audibility and clarity, we assessed whether or not the debater spoke loudly enough so that he or she could be heard, and not just loudly enough, but clearly enough so that words were not jumbled and speech was distinct and clear. Articulation, we listened to determine if any phonics issues were evident. For example, were letters of the alphabet and phonetic combinations distinctly expressed? Were any words mispronounced? Now, to, to differentiate between clarity and articulation, I will give an example because I know that they are very close. So, we listen to hear if the word child was said instead of child. So, you may hear child and you hear it very clearly, but it was mispronounced. Another example, violet instead of violet. Now, these are not examples from tonight. Voice modulation, we focused on voice control. Now, that is proper regulation of tone and pitch. How well were the various tones and pitches applied to convey some aspect of the debater's delivery to emphasize or stress a point, for example? Command of material. Did the debater master his or her delivery through apparent familiarity with the content? Did he or she own the content and demonstrate their understanding of the material, also demonstrating awareness of the subject matter? Persuasiveness, 
Were you as an audience convinced and moreover the judges as the debater urged his or her points across, holding your attention and swaying you into believing? The debater's understanding and position on the moot should influence the minds of those listening to settle in his or her favor. Persuasive tactics are key here. Fluency refers to the flow of speech. Was the debater comfortable or at ease during delivery? Was the pace of speech generally maintained, not too rushed, from being out of time or being nervous and not too slow from factors such as unfamiliarity with the script? Was unnecessary hesitation observed? Eye contact, the intention here is for there to be an appropriate balance of eye contact with fellow debater, opponents, judges, and the audience, and body language, which refers to effective and suitable use of non-verbal communication, such as gestures, movement, and facial expressions. I will now share with you our feedback on each of these aspects before announcing the best speaker. In terms of audibility and clarity, we felt that all debaters were loud enough. However, there were instances where they were not always clear. This appeared to be due to poor breathing technique or speaking too quickly. For articulation, that was fairly good. Now allow me to pause a moment to speak to command of language in this area. Communication, a communication tool for us is the, our language. Now think of language as grammar, punctuation, pronunciation, and so forth. If you use this communication tool incorrectly, you get an undesirable result. And tonight, we noted mispronunciation of a few too many words and also repeat grammatical errors. Now for voice modulation, we found that it was satisfactory for the most part. The majority of debaters made an effort to ensure that their delivery was not monotonous. However, the failure to exploit this technique affected other areas such as persuasiveness. Command of material, this was a challenge for us both in our assessment. What would have convinced us here is better delivery in terms of eye contact and emphasis when required. In the absence of that, it came across that the debaters were not as familiar as they should have been with their scripts. Persuasiveness, some debaters were more passionate than others our attention was held for the most part across debaters, however. But we encourage consistency of passion so that you gain and keep the audience's attention due to your own confidence in your delivery. Fluency. We observed a few instances where debaters became lost in the script as well as ran out of time, and this affected fluency. They sped up when they were out of time, and they stumbled when they were lost in the script. We note a lack of rhythm for some. Eye contact, fairly good results here, but there is a need for improvement, which we suppose is associated with familiarity with the script. Some debaters focused attention on the addressee, and that is highly commendable. And by that, I mean when they mentioned Madam Moderator, they looked at the moderator, they said opponents, were the opponents, they looked at their opponents. And finally, body language. This was generally satisfactory. We observed the timely facial expressions and the gesticulation for the passionate. Again, with familiarity with the script, you would be able 
to add to the body language for emphasis. And so with that, I ask that you join with me in congratulating Rhonda Allen of the opposition as best speaker for the Caribbean Statistics Day debating competition, amassing 160 points out of a possible total of 200 points. So hearty congratulations, Rhonda. You have done well, and we encourage you to challenge yourself never to drop below this standard, but to instead share your strategy and keep growing in that regard. To the other debaters, there can only be one best speaker, unfortunately. But I hope that we have laid a foundation in terms of areas where greater attention could be paid. We commend all of you for the bravery you displayed to stand before this audience and deliver your arguments. It was not easy, we know, and it is an art that you are mastering. We are extremely proud of you and with continued practice, we will have the right cadre of debaters for the next LIDC. Thank you, Ms. Eswick, for such an in-depth analysis of the best speaker, and congratulations to Ms. Rhonda Allen. Ladies and gentlemen, this brings us to the end of the main event, which was the debate, which was the held under the more lack of evidence-based decision-making continues to stymie the economic development of the Caribbean region. And before I leave the stage, I would just like the debaters to stand and for the audience to give them a round of applause. I would now like to hand over, thank you. I would now like to hand over to Ms. Alfie Brown. Good night again, everyone. Thank you, Thandy, so much. Your stage present was am presence was amazing tonight. Thank you so much. Yes, please, everyone, give Thandy Williams a round of applause. Audience, please note our prize giving ceremony will follow shortly. However, we do have a little giveaway for you tonight. Um, if I can ask those of you seated in the green chairs to just calmly reach under your seats and see if you feel anything. We've marked a few of those seats with prizes. If you can just raise your hand if you have one of those and SDM staff will find you and give you that prize. I like how y'all are so calm tonight. You know, people in the red chairs, feel free to come down and see if there's an empty green chair with a sticker. Thank you. Thank you, SDM staff. Debaters, if you can kindly vacate the stage. Thank you so much. You ladies were amazing this evening. We will now have a presentation from the SDM to Ms. Teresina Botkin.
Today, we honor a long-standing statistician for her service to the Department of Statistics and the Government and People of Montserrat. Miss Teresina Budkin is a daughter of the soil. Her early years of education were spent at the Wesley Government School, then on to the Montserrat Secondary School. She proceeded to pursue her tertiary education at the University of the West Indies Cave Hill Campus, where she read for her bachelor's in mathematics and statistics. From 1976 to 1980, Miss Bodkin served as a mathematics teacher at the Lynch's Secondary School in Barbados and at the Montserrat Secondary School from 1980 to 1982. From 1982 to 1994, she was appointed as a statistician at the Statistics Department within the Development Unit and from 1994 served as Senior Statistician, a role she held for 15 years. During her tenure, Miss Budkin had extensive professional training to include the balance of payment statistics with the ECCB and the IMF, national accounts and survey management with the OECS Secretariat, economic management with the World Bank, census management with the CARICOM Secretariat, and survey management in small populations with the European Union, just to name a few. On April 6, 2010, Ms. Bodkin was selected as the first female speaker of the island's Legislative Council, succeeding the former Speaker of the House, Mr. Joseph Mead. Ms. Bodkin is presently employed as an integrated math lecturer at the Montserrat Community College. Most people may not know this, but Miss Budkin is a lover of fun. She thoroughly enjoys a good mentally challenging game and keeps her mind ticking over with quick response times. And she gives the right answers too. Sometimes when the question proves challenging, she may ponder for a while. But rest assured, she will get it right every time. Miss Budkin loves the elderly with a passion and could often be found having lengthy conversations with them, reliving experiences and sharing common stories of times gone by. She firmly believes that the elders have much guidance and advice to offer to the younger generation. In fact, one of her dreams has always been to establish a Grandma for a Day program where younger persons would connect with an elderly person and develop a bond over time through scheduled mentoring and networking. Miss B, as she is affectionately known, often imagined how successful this would be. Over the years, we have observed that Miss Budkin's tastes are unique indeed. Nobody loves an ice cream more than Miss B. And mind you, we are not just talking about regular dull vanilla. We are talking about the ice creams with the fancy names, like the Caramel Twist and the Pistachio Grande. These are the levels to which her taste extends. So while enjoying her ice cream and driving home, she would be in tune to her radio station, listening out for the latest news in politics, locally, regionally, or internationally. She just loves political conversation. While we are not sure if this love came about during her time as speaker or before or even after, we now know that Miss B loves the politics.
She is a woman who appreciates the importance of current affairs and ensures that she is knowledgeable as far as possible. No doubt this has come in very handy within her current teaching role. Finally, but of equal import, is her love for the drums. Oh, how her hands and those little drums move in time to create an exquisite sound, which in turn brings excitement to all around. On many an occasion, the audience would wow. We must see her again, many have vowed. Overall, here we see a driven, kind-hearted, and carefree individual with a keen love for life and people, a multi-talented and light-hearted woman with years of well-rounded experience professionally and socially. We at the Statistics Department are grateful for the example and the legacy which stalwarts such as Miss B have left behind. We continue to salute her outstanding contribution to the government and people of Montserrat and wish continued success in all her future endeavors. Ladies and gentlemen, let us all welcome Miss B, Miss Teresina Budkin. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to invite Ms. Teresina Bodkin to the stage, as well as Chief Statistician Chewitt. Almost didn't recognize myself there for a minute. Madam Chair, I wish to lead by acknowledging and stating our appreciation for the attendance here this evening of distinguished members of our community and I noted the presence of members of our now prorogued legislative assembly and indeed all of our distinguished members of the esteemed audience. I want to crave your indulgence for a moment and extend a special salute to our debating teams from the Munstrad Community College, our, our hope is that this evening's exercise gives them a shot in the arm and a boost in the confidence so that they will dive headlong into the next challenge that they receive at this level. to the business at hand. Delighted, honored, 
deeply appreciative and deeply touched. These are the words which can best describe my feelings as I accept this thoughtful gesture. Events like this inevitably cause us to reflect, and this evening's exercise is no exception. I'm going to share one or two of my recollections and invite you to do a mental comparison of the work environment then and how it exists now. In 1982, September, I became this 26-year-old statistician who was put, put to work alongside a UN volunteer to manually develop some 11 by 17 sized hard copy worksheets which came together to compile the national accounts. I believe the statistics department still uses those worksheets today, although they are all now fully automated. At that time also, we manually entered information from customs documents into a computer. That computer was the size of a small piano and stored the data on floppy disks, which were almost nine inches square. That's the size, if you don't know, of a large dinner plate. We've come a long way, have we not? Seriously, though, none of what was said by the biographer would have been possible at all without the groundbreaking work of a number of pioneering individuals. I must pay homage, first of all, to a brilliant man, my schoolmate, one Mr. Alwyn Hausen. He it was who designed and developed the local framework for the processes and procedures we now undertake in the conduct of the national census. By the way, Alwyn was a member of the debating team, which represented Montserrat in the very first Leeward Islands debate in 1971. He was also, at the time, president of the debating society. Secondly, I would like to cite Mr. Clarence Max Greer, another brilliant man, my chief statistician, who oversaw the establishment of the system of national accounting and the balance of payments statistics. Max also must be recognized for initiating the process of computerizing the, decide, the department's statistical databases. It was also Max who, within three months of my having joined the department, prepared and sent this 26-year-old statistician off to represent Montserrat at the annual meeting of the Standing Committee of Caribbean Statisticians. What a vote of confidence. Thank you, Max. Thirdly, I must cite Ms. Angela Maureen Estwick, who spearheaded much of the development and management of the sophisticated computer information systems which now host the national statistical databases. Our fervent wish, Ms. Estwick, is that God continues to bless your endeavors in your new capacity. I have also to remember Katrina Ryan, God rest her, the first director of our recently established independent statistical entity. I just wish that the system would have been far more supportive of both your efforts. I'm going to list some names. Hazel Corbin, Ivan Michael, Yolanda Goodwin, Gladwin Henry, Desiree Zachariah, Claudius Preville, all past employees of the OECS Secretariat, which was instrumental 
in developing statistical systems within the OACS sub-region, which included Montserrat. The Secretariat at that time was located in Antigua and was well equipped and staffed to provide the necessary backstopping. Thank you. To Sheila Bass, Lucilla Lewis, and Jackie Ferracho, the pioneers from the ECCB, who helped us establish our balance of payment systems. Alfreda Mead, Claudette Weeks, Lola Harris, all of the local ECCB office, who also provided invaluable support. Thank you. To Siobhan and the, the members of the statistics department, if you rem remember nothing else of what I have said this evening, please remember this. Do not spend too much of your precious time looking to external sources for answers. Sometimes all of the resources you require reside with you. Do not be afraid to trust your instincts even as you are absorbing the knowledge being shared by external technocrats. Secondly, a recurring decimal, whenever I interviewed anyone for recruitment into the department, was teamwork is a big thing with us. I urge you to incorporate this tenet into your day-to-day -day work ethic. It will go a long way in helping you survive and overcome much of what may be thrown at you from today's increasingly difficult to navigate work environment. I want to once again thank you for your expression of appreciation. And to the audience, thank you for listening and for supporting tonight's venture. And I want to wish the Department of Statistics every success and to let them know that I stand ready to assist them in whatever way they wish, whenever they wish. Thank you again. Thank you, Ms. Bodkin. If we can give her another round of applause. We will now have the presentation of participation certificates, which will be awarded to the debaters as well as their research teams, followed by the participatory trophies to the debaters. If I can have CS to it. First, I will start with our researchers. If I can have Angenique Castle. Ms. Angenique Castle. Next, we'll have Ms. Tiffany Weeks. Ms. Tiffany Weeks. Next, we'll have Ms. Dariona Osborne. I hope I said that correctly. Next, we'll have Ms. Danielle Martin. Danielle Martin. Okay, we'll move on to Eldina O'Garro. Eldina O'Garro. Next, Ms. Akela Davis. Akela Davis.
And our final researcher, Kenita Barzi. Ms. Kenita Barzi. Next, we'll have the proposition for speaker, Shanae Taylor Lee. Next, from the proposition. Second speaker, Ms. Ashanti Francis. Ms. Ashanti Francis. And the opposition, first speaker, Ms. Rhonda Allen. And second speaker from the opposition, Miss Beyonce Osborne. Miss Beyonce Osborne. I'll now call the debaters back to the stage for their participatory trophies. If I can please have once again the first speaker of the proposition, Shanae Taylor Lee. Yes, clapping for them is a good idea. Absolutely. They worked hard tonight. Second speaker of the proposition, Ms. Ashanti Francis. First speaker of the opposition. Ms. Rhonda Allen. And second speaker of the opposition, Ms. Beyonce Osborne. I would now like to invite Ms. Montserrat 2018-2019, Ms. Vanice Chewitt, to the stage for the presentation of the remaining awards. I'd also like to take a moment to thank our sponsors. This evening, our debaters will receive gifts courtesy of Bank of Montserrat, Flow and the Department of Community Youth and Sports Services. The winners will receive $500 each towards tuition or CAPE exams, courtesy of Department of Community Youth and Sports Services, as well as Bank of Montserrat.
the best speaker will also be rewarded $500 towards tuition or CAPE exams. In addition, all three of our winners will receive Flow Weekly Combo Packages, packages Complements of Flow. I'd first like to call our winners, uh, the opposition to the stage. That is Ms. Rhonda Allen and Ms. Beyonce Osborne. And we will now present to our best speaker of the evening, Ms. Rhonda Allen. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank our judges and our moderator for their time and service. If Ms. Munsrat can please remain on stage to award our judges and our moderator their gifts, I'd most appreciate it. Judges, if I can please have Ms. Angela Eswick. Ladies, look pretty for the photo op. Don't worry, the gifts are coming. Smile for the camera. <laughs> Thank you, Miss Eswick. If I can now call Miss Angela Grinaway to the stage. No, it's late and we're tired, but let's clap for them. They did a really, really hard job today in deliberating. Kimona Daniel Bourne. Mr. Kenya Lee. Thank you, Kenya. Mr. DK Ross Rustent. I can try that again. Mr. D.K. Rostent. <laughs> Mr. D.K. Rostan. Thank you. Miss Gracelyn Castle. Thank you. And Mr. Martin Parley. Please be careful. Thank 
Thank you. And our moderator, Miss Thandy Williams. On behalf of the Statistics Department, Montserrat, I would like to explicitly thank our sponsors, Bank of Montserrat, FLO, the Department of Community, Youth and Sports Services, specially invited guests, government officials, the debaters, researchers, staff sponsors, Ms. Daphne Furlong and Mistress Barron, our key stakeholders, Mistress Chalmers, Media Houses, and the principal of MCC, Mistress Geraldine Cady, as well as all of our volunteers. Please keep in mind, all contributions received tonight will be handed over to the Montreal Community College debaters towards the upcoming Leeward Islands Debating Competition 2020, which is to be tentatively hosted by Montserrat. Thank you everyone for coming out this evening and for your time. Have a lovely evening and get home safe. I just want you to know.